What keeps you awake at night? The stress at work? The soaring prices of petrol? Or that thing you said at a party? Don't stick that thing up my asshole! But still feel embarrassed about to this day? Well, how about the crippling fear of being buried alive? Perhaps that last one's not quite at the top of your list, but in the 19th century, anxiety about being buried alive, so-called tapophobia, was rampant, and for good reason as well. On the 2nd of May 1891, Octavia Hatcher was pronounced dead following months of fevers, headaches, and extreme fatigue. She was buried in her local cemetery in the small town of Pikeville, Kentucky in the USA. But over the next couple of days, other people <laughs> began to exhibit similar <laughs> symptoms. And it soon became apparent that a mysterious sleeping sickness was sweeping through the sleepy town, one that many people were eventually waking up from. Worried that Octavia had been met with a similar fate, her family rushed to her grave to dig up her coffin, but when they opened the coffin's lid, they were met with a horrific sight. The inner lining had been shredded and torn, and Octavia's nails were bent back and bloodied. She was now well and truly dead, but it was clear that Mrs. Hatcher had been buried alive. I mean, no wonder everyone was tapophobic when you've got stories like that doing the rounds. To avoid meeting the same end, inventors on both sides of the Atlantic set about creating the ultimate safety coffin, one that could be opened from the inside. Now, some even had alarm bells integrated into their designs in case the coffin's occupant needed any extra help getting out. Doctors have always been intrigued by the boundaries between life and death, and this interest led to the foundation of the Royal Humane Society in London in 1744. Known at the time as a society for the recovery of persons apparently drowned, their aim was to develop and disseminate information on how to perform life-saving first aid with the aim of bringing people back from death's door. At the time, mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation was considered a vulgar practice, but the use of tobacco enemas where tobacco smoke was literally pumped up the dying person's anus with a set of bellows was apparently totally acceptable. There are a small number of reports that this procedure actually might have worked, but it's more likely that the patients were startled back to life by having hot air pumped up their ass rather than the life-affirming powers of a bum full of backy. The Royal Humane Society did encourage more effective treatments too, though, namely the use of electricity to shock the victims back to consciousness. A report from the Society in 1794 described how, after falling out of a second-story window, a child named Sophia Greenhill had been brought back from the brink by the application of electricity to her chest. But it wasn't until the 18th century that we were really able to harness the power of electricity for ourselves. An Italian physician called Luigi Galvani was the first of many to demonstrate electricity's ability to stimulate movement in dead bodies. Now, we're talking frogs here, not people. Yet, he showed how live wires attached to the nerves and muscles of dead frogs would cause their lifeless limbs to twitch vigorously. His nephew, Giovanni Aldini, took these death-defying demonstrations one step further. One freezing morning in 1803, the murderer George Forster was hung from the gallows at London's Newgate Prison. Seconds after drawing his last breath, Forster's limp body was rushed off to the Royal College of Surgeons in London. This was where he was laid out onto a long stone slab in the middle of the operating theatre. Pacing beside him was Aldini, casually swinging two metal wires in his hands attached to a tall column of metal plates. Anyway, as the chattering of the nervous onlookers died down, Aldini attached two wires to the dead man's temples before walking back towards his mysterious metal contraption. The wires made contact. Immediately, Forster's face contorted violently and his left eye snapped open. The crowd gasped and jumped back into their seats, but Aldini simply smiled and calmly let go of the wires. Many of his onlookers felt that they had witnessed a miracle. But ultimately, Aldini had not been able to restart the corpse's heart, and once he removed the wires from the body, it became lifeless once more. Okay, so this whole spark of life thing, 
made for some impressive demonstrations and was even responsible for one of the most important and seminal pieces of literature of the 19th century, Frankenstein. But how legit is the science behind any of this? Well, believe it or not, it's actually a lot more reasonable than you might think. The work of Galvani and his ambitious nephew Aldini ignited a spark in the scientific community that eventually led to the discovery of action potentials and the essential role of electricity in all living things. Electricity is essential to biology. It powers our every movement, our every thought, even our consciousness itself is pure electricity. Even your heartbeat is controlled almost entirely by electrical signals. And thanks to modern technology, electricity can actually be used to resuscitate people who are clinically dead. Okay, that's great, but what does actually being clinically dead mean? Surely dead is just dead. Well, there are actually two different kinds of death, clinical death and biological death. Clinical death is when you stop breathing and your blood stops flowing, so yeah, I guess you're pretty dead. But in some cases, this kind of death is still reversible. Take Audrey Showman, a British woman who developed severe hypothermia whilst hiking in a snowstorm in the Spanish Pyrenees Mountains. Crazy. She was clinically dead for six hours before she eventually regained consciousness. Really lucky to be here and uh, be able to get on with my life. In fact, enough people have spontaneously regained heart function after being clinically dead that the phenomenon has even earned its own name. Lazarus syndrome, pretty biblical. And incredibly, 35% of people with this condition managed to return to a normal, healthy life afterwards. Right, so that's pretty horrifying, but how do we know when someone is properly dead dead? Now, this is where we turn our attention to the second kind of death, biological death. Now, this happens when a patient has no remaining brain activity. Once you are brain dead, there is no coming back. The problem is the bodies of brain dead patients can continue to function, albeit not very effectively, in the absence of an active brain. So yeah, Humans are never going to be able to match up to the achievements of Mike the Headless Chicken, who survived without a head for 18 months. And I know some people who do that too. Conversely, brain activity can also continue for some time after the heart has stopped beating, and studying this activity could give us some idea of what really goes on in someone's head after they've drawn their last breath. As much as we'd like to think that we can draw a nice clear line between life and death, it's just not that straightforward. Death is not just a singular event. It's a gradual process of shutting down that can go on for hours, even days. We've still got a long way to go before we can definitively say the exact point of passing. Today, us doctors perform all sorts of tests on patients to make sure that they are well and truly gone, but on very, very rare occasions, people do make mistakes. So maybe it's worth investing in one of those safety coffins after all.